Alléluia. Hello everyone. Uh, welcome to the session on uh, artificial intelligence and data visitation working group. And I just have to learn how to use these contraptions. Where's the remote? Um... Oh, thank you. And I just move. Teach me, please teach me. Here, okay. So my name is Claudia Bowser Medeiros. I'll uh, manage the first part of the session and then Anne will manage the second part. And the co-chairs of this session are uh, the co-chairs of the group myself, Francis is over there, Elif who's going to speak afterwards, and, and Chiamo. So uh, basically, what is data visitation? And the idea of data visitation is that data stays where it is and processes and will visit and requests for executions will visit the data, request analysis and get the results returned data never moves whoops okay sorry so there are lots of ethical and legal uh, challenges involved and we are going to discuss them as you'll see throughout the presentations this is a very active uh, working group with more than 50 members from all over and uh, we are discussing uh, the challenges of when all these data visitation activities occur in a network. Uh, what are the challenges involved? And of course, there are technical and people challenges, in particular, ethical and legal challenges. And we divided ourselves in five subgroups, all of which will present their results today. We've been working since October last year, so it's a new working group. And these are the five subgroups that you'll see will follow. And um, I'll call now the first presenter. The, I'm going to kind of rush through presentations because we have 10 presenters and we want to leave at least half an hour for questions at the end. Okay, so keep your questions to the end. And I'd like to call Ugoshi to unmute and talk about our fellow program within the working group. Ugoshi, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. So, hi. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon from here. So, my name is Ugochi Adaku Kengu, as um, colleague Claudia said. I'm here to present about the fellows in our AI DV working group. First, who is an AI DV working group fellow? He or she is a researcher, a professor in, in academia, or a PhD holder, or an MSc, or a student, or an MSc holder. And we belong to the five different deliverable groups that was mentioned earlier. And one person, one fellow can belong in more than one deliverable group. And we have activities that we perform in these different deliverable groups. We conduct research around European open science cloud future. And the research we are meant to conduct, at the end of the day, we are meant to present a five to 10 pages technical report about these deliverable goals. And these activities, these goals of these um, deliverable groups form together the main goal of our working group, which um, other uh, presenters will mention further as they present. Then as a fellow in this uh, working group fellowship, there's a lot of benefits we gain because I am one of the fellows. We gain knowledge by interacting with one another we exchange ideas and research skills about bordering around open science and looking for ways uh, the, the, the open science implementation will be made more secured and, and be more uh, usable by researchers or 
anybody that wants to access this data and all the resources that will be available. Then, apart from exchanging of ideas and research skills, we're from different um, disciplines. We have medical doctors, we have um, professors from universities, we have uh, research defense officers, we have legal practitioners in all part of this uh, fellowship. And we have different views also because we are from different uh, demographic segments. We have people from Nigeria, Russia, US, uh, Botswana, Brazil, Canada, and Philippines. So coming together to uh, exchange ideas and research skills, at the end of the day, we are being enriched as fellows with the idea of um, knowing more about artificial intelligence and data visitation, which is uh, the name of our working group. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. You just um, forgot to mention where you are. Okay, I'm presently in Nigeria, Patakot. I'm a lecturer in University of Patakot. Oh, okay. Thank you very much. So Thank let's you. continue with the next presentation which is Elif. Elif, if you can, you can, there is a microphone. You can, the microphone, okay. You, you want to, Elif is one of the co-chairs of the group. Okay. Hello. So, um, thank you, Claudia. Um, I'm, I'm Elif Ekmekci. I'm from Turkey in origin. I'm a medical doctor and I'm an ethicist and I'm the co-chair of this um, working group. So um, today I'm just going to um, give a very, very short presentation about the um, necessity of AI ethics and the role of AI ethics in contributing to the ecosystem for open science. And when we are talking about open science, I'm not going to go through all these because I'm sure you all know them. But I should say that in terms of open science and ethics, we have to um, include all these different perspectives of ethics into equation, like research ethics, which brings together responsible conduct of research and principle-based approach, uh, like the four uh, principles of biomedical ethics. And also we have to put in the data ethics in terms of big data, real-time data, AI and ML and fair data. And also we have to consider institutional ethics like IRBs or ethics committees and uh, transparency and conflict of interest. And then we have to put in the science and society ethics, which are all listed here, like fair, justified surveillance, promoting the common good, uh, and interventions made possible by open science results in social moral change, which is really even more important that we all accomplish, uh, as far as I, uh, I think. And core concepts like privacy and confidentiality, which are subject to social moral change, and the balance or tension between the individual rights and the common good. So um, this, these are the ethical aspects that come into equation in terms of open science and what happens when we put in AI. So you may ask, why do we need a special or a novel perspective for AI ethics? Because we already have technology ethics, you know, it has been <laughs> developing since Plato and we have very different uh, aspects and frames to uh, assess and think about uh, technology ethics. So the first question is, do we need a new ethical framework for AI? And the second one is, how can we define this new framework? And the third one is, what happens to this new framework if we're going to run it in terms of open science? So there are some you know, um, different layers that we have to think about. Um, for, for the answer to the first question, um, does the present ethics of technology apply to AI? It doesn't. Because of these, uh, I try to make these really, really very short. Uh, I can talk on these for hours, but I only have five minutes, so I'm just going to run through them. Uh, the capabilities and functions of AI are not always determined and controlled by human beings, and the pathways of operations and functions are not always known by human beings. And um, AI can evolve, self-learn, self-generate, and act in 
uh, real life and high level functions which require intention, creativity and strategy can be perform performed by AI. So in terms of putting the ethics of AI and open science together, we have to talk about the first four issues that I mentioned before. And then we have to also look into these um, areas like the black box problem, the explainability, autonomy issues, moral and legal responsibility, and personhood issues, bias and transparency, and data integrity, and lack of intuition in terms of um, AI that has uh, a probable uh, capability in real life. So in our working group, uh, we are trying to find answers to all these um, questions uh, with all my colleagues. Thank you. Thank you. So you covered everything in five minutes. Let's yeah. go to the next presenter. <laughs> and the next presenter is Lars. Oh, you want the microphone yeah. and well, you don't need a pointer because you have just no, one slide. See if I can find a space to stand. <clears throat> so I'm 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 Lars Eklund, and together with uh, Chinese Martis, uh, we've been uh, we've been tasked with uh, sort of um, heading the data visitation parts. And uh, Claudia did an excellent <sighs> introduction to it. Um, but when it comes down to the the mission that we feel that our subgroup has is that we need to to assist uh, uh, and provide input from the data visitation perspective into the AI group because it is not a complete uh, overlap between data visitation and AI, of course, because you can have AI without data visitation and you can have data visitation without AI. Um, Shiny uh, is showing one of uh, the example here of, of how they use uh, data visitation to, to perform uh, in silico clinical trials at her company Nova that she's working at. And uh, uh, this uh, model that has been uh, taken up from Nordfox shows uh, about how uh, you can make an authentication uh, uh, system for um, the um, cross-border uh, uh, utilization of sensitive data. Uh, and both of these show the importance of data visitation, in that data visitation ultimately comes down to trust. It's a way of enhancing trust. And of course, then comes the big differences. What is trust and how do we do that? Well, that's where we all have a good <laughs> deal of work to do. But, but uh, the, the idea is that if you use data visitation, you facilitate the, the acceptance of, of trust between people because you do not move the data away to somewhere else where you don't have control of it. Thank you very much. As you see, this is a very dynamic group. And now we have another presenter. Thank you very much. Because lots of us are showing different facets of what we are doing. And as I mentioned before, our group is divided into five subgroups, each of which with specific tasks of investigating AI and data visitation under a specific prism. So now the first uh, group is going, the results, the preliminary results, survey on current ethical, legal policy and societal frameworks for AI and DV is Brian. Brian, please just present yourself and unmute yourself, present yourself, and present your summary slide. Obrigado, Claudia. Um, You're welcome. Good afternoon, Dr. Wood, three billion for a hair. Uh, my name is Brian Pickering. I am a cyber psychologist in the University of Southampton in the UK. Uh, you can, you can um, show your screen. I mean, your face, everybody wants to see what you look like. <laughs> in the interest of anonymity. <laughs> there you go. Um, <clears throat> right, so this, this part um, of the project, and as I say, I'm a psychologist, so therefore I'm looking specifically at human responses. Um, data visitation, or as it's been uh, uh, titled in the literature, model to data has been around for quite some time, especially in um, bioinformatics. 
Well, there are some real important questions that we need to uh, address. Um, so I've listed them on the left hand side there. What we're looking at um, is how private individuals actually feel about their data uh, being used in advanced technology. And of course, there was the conversation before uh, about the chatbot. Um, but also, what do the domain experts believe should be part of the kind of approval process, the review process? when looking at these advanced algorithms and how they're used. But most importantly, what do the stakeholders under, understand by data visitation? As I say, it's been around in medical bioinformatics for some time, but what do they really understand? Um, on the right-hand side, so some of the work which we've been doing already. Um, so of course, you look at the literature, what's available in the academic sphere. Uh, my colleague, uh, Richard Martinez, um, from Valencia has done a lot of work around governance and the governance structures for sharing and exploiting data, especially in healthcare. Um, my colleague uh, Steve Taylor and I ran a Delphi study a couple of years ago to ask experts what the real uh, issues were around responsible AI. So that's on the academic side, but on the grey literature side, and Alif mentioned this just before, um, there is quite a lot of uh, activity going on in government and NGO circles to try and define the area and say what we're looking at. Uh, empirically, uh, we've done some separate work and, and we're taking this forward now um, in the UK. So remember the UK is made up of, of 70 million sensible people, so we don't include the government. So 96% of UK citizens um, reported that they were very concerned about how their data was being used. Um, they didn't understand the regulation, uh, which was kind of scary, but also they felt that they didn't make, um, that they were not in a position to make informed decisions. And of course, later you'll hear about what work has been going on in the working group around informed uh, consent. And then this final piece, so moving forward, uh, we'll take, which is a very uh, common methodology in uh, behavioral science. You get together some experts, you ask them to discuss it, you pull out the main themes and then generate uh, a survey to go back to the general public and say, okay, answer this, how do you feel? What are your attitudes um, around these areas which we believe to be important? So <clears throat> that's this particular part, work package one. Uh, and of course, as a psychologist, I would say this is the most important piece. <laughs> Back to you, Claudia. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Nice to see you again. Uh, let's go now to the second group, which is guidance on legal considerations for AI and DV. And that's Alexander, who's going to speak. Don't Brilliant. forget to present yourself. Brilliant. My name is Alex Bernier. I'm an academic associate at the Center of Genomics and Policy at McGill University. I'm a lawyer by training, and most of my work is involved in uh, specifying data protection law standards to international data sharing efforts, mostly in genomics. Today, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about guidance for, uh, sorry, the, the legal guidance that we're developing for AI and data visitation. Um, next slide, please. Um, so this essentially builds off of two previous efforts. That's the least legible slide I've ever seen. Apologies, but essentially. Um, Two policy reports were developed in the last few years as part of the Horizon 2020 effort, looking at how different organizations were developing their, their own internal data governance standards for things like population health studies and other efforts to bring together and share information. The first report looked at essentially 26 or so population health studies that had developed internal policies for how you could use and share data about the, the population amongst different centers. So this uh, data had been generated from 1970, 1980 or so up until today. And what we found was that most of these studies allowed for the reuse of information that they were generating for its sharing but the specific reasons for which that information could be used were completely unharmonized across each of those centers, which meant that it was near impossible to use the information together. So what you can see here is that absent some kind of coordinating device, some kind of legal norm, it's near impossible for organizations to make sure that they end up with the same policy rules determining how they're allowed to use their information and how they can't. Um, the second slide, uh, sorry, the second, um, 
report here was published, or rather is being published right now, and was drafted in 2022. And this was a response on the part of eight Horizon 2020 initiatives um, that had tried to generate and share biomedical data, um, share it using usually federated analysis or other methodologies. And what they found was that, on the contrary, if the problem that they had met in the first instance was a lack of guidance from regulators, a lack of clarity as to what could be done with data, in the second instance, the GDPR, having one blanket regulation for what you could do with all information, was itself creating barriers for what you could re, uh, do with existing data. So specifically, that there was too much guidance from regulators, that the existence of blanket rules meant that different organizations couldn't specify their own rules for how to use information enough, and that even though there was a broad binding norm in place, it didn't play well with the needs of specific communities in terms of developing their own technical mm -hmm. standards. Uh, next slide, please, and I'll, I'll keep this really short. Um, what we're doing with the AI Data Visitation Working Group's Deliverable 2 is to make an impassioned plea for a co-regulatory approach to um, the sharing and utilization of data. So this is somewhere between um, not having specific regulation in place and you know, really letting each different group decide how to use their information on their own and having blanket omnibus laws that might speak to everyone. The, the way that it works is by having uh, regulated parties specify uh, you know, an ombudsperson, uh, basically an adjudicator that's responsible for applying law to them and self-developing a code of conduct or another regulatory instrument that will take the general demands of regulators and translate them into specific policy requirements. This is an approach that tends to be used in areas where regulators have clear asks for regulated parties, but the, the area in question is so technical or, or so difficult for a, you know, a, a general legislature to understand that they need um, external experts to come in and develop and apply particular policy standards. Um, and so that's pretty much what we're up to right now. If we could just look at the last slide. Um, the, uh, the regulatory and, and co-regulatory models tend to be used in areas where there are deep information asymmetries between the regulator and regulated parties, um, or in incredibly fast-moving industries, things like financial regulation or the regulation of technologies, medical device regulation, and so forth. Um, it's already integrated into a number of European laws. The GDPR implements it through things like codes of conduct and uh, certification marks and the European Union's AI Act um, is principally a co-regulatory model where specific members of industry or other will uh, basically design regulatory systems and ask to apply them to particular regulated industries. Um, so I'll, I'll end there because I suspect I have already run over time. That's, that's okay, but it's time to end anyways. Pardon? It's okay. Fair enough. Um, <laughs> I mean, okay, well, all this to say that we see a lot of promise in the use of co-regulatory approaches in which governments set out specific policy requirements and industry, uh, nonprofits, and other groups develop technical codes or um, you know, other regulatory mechanisms that respond to those demands and then step forward as adjudicators to apply them to particular regulated areas. Um, and we hope to release a policy report between now and August that will take um, this general literature and specify how it could be implemented in a European context, building on existing EU regulatory efforts. Um, thank you and all thank, for listening. Thank you. You'll come back and again. Glad to thank start. you. Everybody was given five minutes and everybody's good. No, we haven't finished. We still have five more presentations. And um, so this is the liberal three guidance for informed consent in artificial intelligence data visitation. And here we'll have two presenters, Luis Retanan from the Philippines and Amy Dubreuil from France. So who's going to present this first slide? Is it? Uh, I'll be presenting first, Professor, for the first slide. Just just uh, show ourselves your face. Oh, you have to show his face there, please. I've already turned on my camera, so. Yeah, but I had, yeah, uh, yeah thank you. While as long, uh, I would only ask the other presenters not to open their cameras until they have can hold the can talk. Thank you. 
There you are, Luis. Okay. So um so um good day everyone. So I am Luis Jacob Retanan of the Deliverable Group on Informed Consent Guidance. So as an initial step, our group conducted a preliminary review of 30 documents relating to informed consent and to its practice and conception in today's data-driven world. So 15 each at global and European levels. We have three general criteria for document selection. First, they are from authoritative sources such as the UN, EU, and Council of Europe that constantly engage with experts. Second, these documents are inclusive, so they seek consensus and applicability not only within a certain sector, but also within various fields. And third, these documents have some, if not all, of the listed keywords as presented in the slide, um, which show their relevance to our main goal. So for this review, we have two objectives. First, to gauge the extent and intensity of relevant keywords across documents at both levels. And second, to understand how informed consent is currently described and or conceptualized in the context of AI and data visitation. So our group has two outputs. First is on the extent and intensity of the usage of keywords, which we manage to summarize into a table in our poster presentation. For this output, we are exact and strict about the keywords, but although it also highlights nuances. So for example, autonomy in other documents, there is no direct mention of it, but it is implied in the concepts such as individual self-determination, individual control, and etc. And for the second output, it delved more on the conceptualization of informed consent and how it developed in light of the impact of artificial intelligence and data visitation. So here we look on its basis and connection with data protection and AI. So for the initial observations at the global level, so here are the highlights. So first, most frequently mentioned keywords are informed consent, transparency, data protection, and data processing. And artificial intelligence is only mentioned in 53% of the documents reviewed. There is no direct mention of data visitation in any of the 15 documents reviewed. Second, conceptualization of informed consent is closely aligned with Kantian philosophy, which emphasizes individual freedom, human autonomy, and dignity. So for the European level, I now give the floor to my colleague, Noemi. Um, thank you. Thank you, Louis. So now I invite Noemi from Quebec. Can you please thank you, Louis. Thank you, Louis. Thank you, Louis. Thank you, Louis. Yes, hello. Um, so I'm Noemi. Uh, do you hear me? Yes? Yes, perfect. Yes, okay. Thank you. Um, as Luis presented, I focused on the European level to analyze several documents uh, in order to identify how informed consent could be considered in the context of AI and DV. From the 15 co documents analyzed, it appears that access and use of data are considered to represent a high risk for data privacy and data protection. In addition, IA is also a risk. Therefore, a majority of the documents record the, the affirmation of the respect of fundamental rights in order to provide a sufficient protection. Informed consent is a tool to ensure privacy, individual autonomy, and freedoms. First of all, informed consent is presented as a guarantee of the effectiveness of fundamental rights. Then it appears that informed consent is implemented in different ways, depending, depending on whether um, it is a question of consent for access or use of data, consent for the use of AA, or even depending on the purpose of use. So uh, there is a balance between protection and innovation, and the analysis of the documents sometimes breaks out a criticism on, of strict consent, which is considered to hamper the access of the and the use of data. In this context, the requirement of transparency and trust and of a proactive consideration of individuals means that the classic form of informed consent must be reconsidered. So uh, the next steps of uh, uh, for a working group are to reconsider the notion of DV, perhaps in relation with, with in, sorry, in relation to the notion of data access, in order to cl clarify the concept uh, and therefore the approach to be followed afterwards. Then uh, redefi redefining informed consent towards a more adaptive form. 
uh, focusing on the importance of information, transparency, and explainability without inhibiting the RTD. The, the concept of trust or self-determination could be highlighted and a dynamic concept could be set up, but still without reducing the information requirements. And finally, providing sufficiently clear recommendation for the implementation of informed consent, particularly in the research domain by taking differences in its use into consideration. Thank you very much. Thank you, Noemi. Both of you together did it in five minutes. Congratulations. So let's go. Our team is very dynamic and very efficient. So let's go to deliverable four, guidance for ethics committees reviewing AI Divi, presented by Valerie. If you can present yourself, please. Unmute yourself and present yourself. Thank you, thank you, Claudia, for compliment. <laughs> I am Valerie Sakolchik. I'm from Belarus, the Republican Center on Bioethics. And um, it's a great honor to represent my group, which has included very brilliant scientists uh, from uh, USA, from uh, Indonesia, from China, Turkey, and my right hand, uh, my Belarusian colleagues, Alexey Rozovanov and Natalia Chikhovich. And um, some, some words about our work. Uh, we, we were founded on um, different methods. Uh, firstly, it was literature review, not only papers, but also guidance, discussions, uh, recent webinars, etc. And also we tried to uh, use a, a, sh a small pilot survey, uh, interviews with uh, IT specialists, AI specialists, the teachers, the researchers, etc. And uh, then uh, we we have uh, the the line to, to our to our research to our study. Firstly, we we tried to to discuss the main challenges of uh, working with AI and data visitation, especially the challenges for ethic committees. Uh, I uh, we we thought about uh, to. Two kind of uh, two kind of challenges, uh, uh, classical challenges like informed consent and confidentiality. But of course, uh, there are new options of these classical challenges and new ways to realize these challenges. And about new ethical challenges like new entity and uh, triangle, uh, such as uh, developer user and uh, AI, a system of artificial intelligence, and uh, also bias, bias human against artificial intelligence. And all these problems, all these challenges and approaches where you know, we try to, to re realize in our discussion principles principles for, for the working with AI and data visitation, and also the principles for, for uh, checking, for reviewing, uh, for ethical committees. The, we, we, were do, we divided these principles for two groups. Uh, first group is objective principles, uh, like safety, governability, explainability and transparency and efficacy. Uh, these principles are, I think, um, more objective and uh, more optional. Uh, and the second group is subjective principles uh, like justice and trust. These are more complicated because um, the, these principles are closely connected with people's emotions, with people's mind, with people's knowledge etc 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 and uh, the third step will be every principle we try to discuss about what are the sense of these principles and uh, what we need to realize these principles and the third step will be to recommend it for ethical commissions co committees or commissions or <laughs> another organization how to review the, the research according to these main principles. And please, next slide. 
I will uh, show you a little bit uh, our short, our small uh, pilot survey. Uh, we, we made it with my Belarusian colleague in uh, Eastern Europe and uh, Central Asia, only 100, 105 uh, respondents. Uh, and uh, we, we tried to, to find uh, the foundation for, for our, uh, try to find if our direction is right or not, how will people how will people understand the artificial intelligence, how they understand the data visitation, how, how they think what will help for ethical committees to, to review the, the research conducted with the NDV. And uh, I, I will not uh, speak more about this pilot survey because we made uh, the poster and uh, you can see it uh, in the book. And uh, if, uh, if Charles is here, I will take the floor for, for our- No, uh, I'm sorry. No, she, she's oh, not very, sorry. very bad because she tried to, to represent uh, the slide uh, about your experience in USA, not only your experience of your, your country, about the main documents, about the main research, research and about the main practice uh, according to AI and data visitation. But if, if Chalice is not here, I, I can't, <laughs> I can't uh, replace her <laughs> because her, her experience is brilliant. That's why I try to finish my presentation. Thank you so much. Yes, she could not make it to send me a mail that she would not be able to appear. Okay. Okay. So thank you so much. Um, and please, uh, yes. So now we come to the less deliverable and then we'll have a long question and answer session, which is an AI Bill of Rights. Uh, and Natalie, please unmute and show yourself. And Hello, present Claudia. Hi. Hi, how are you? Well, I, we are online, so better not discuss this. <laughs> it's great to join the plenary virtually. Um, I'm here from the AI Bill of Rights sub team and underlying the growing application and use of AI and data visitation is a concern to ensure that data subjects are protected by these new technologies. Claudia, could you advance the slide? Sure. Our team has a mission to produce AI Bill of Rights communiques for the EASC Future Project and the Research Data Alliance that promote fundamental human rights and advance trust in AI and federated systems for open science. On our team, we're doing a literature review of emerging AI rights and protections, which is shared at the link on the screen. It informs a matrix of rights and protections we are developing. We use this work to advance discussion of layering and balancing jurisdictional, disciplinary rights and protections. Our team is co-coordinated by myself from the Lucy Family Institute for Data and Society in the United States. Ayuchi Exibo, our fellow from Nigeria, Shiny Martis B in computational biology from Nova Discovery in France, Ronit Pernan Lakach, a smart city scholar from Tel Aviv University in Israel, Yi Yang Su, an associate research fellow at the Institute of Basic Medicine and Cancer at the Chinese Academy of Science. AI and open research are truly international efforts today. Therefore, I'd like to share that UNESCO is seeking to hire four senior experts for the preparation of AI readiness country reports in Chile, Mexico, Morocco, and Senegal with an application deadline in two days. I'd like to invite all attending, especially those from those countries, Chile, Mexico, Morocco, and Senegal to check the plenary job board for a link to the opportunity. And I'll paste that in the chat. Thank you so much, Claudia.
Now, thank you so much, Natalie. And before we start the question and answer uh, session, I like to call Francis with our cheerless, not cheerless, fearless. <laughs> so sorry, I got all mixed up. I'm a foreigner, so I'm allowed these. Uh, to, to talk, just can you come here and, and say a few words about the whole, where's the microphone? Oh, it's over here. And then we go to the question and answer. Thank you, Francis. Uh, thank you, Claudia and, and uh, Alif, uh, my co-workers. Uh, you can see we have a great team. I mean, it's just a fantastic team. And this is just the tip of the iceberg of everything they're doing. Um, I only have one interest in this whole meeting. I only came here for one reason. There's the poster on the board from chat GTP, BGPT. We had Elif's presentation. We're going to have to vote, but we won't do it here. I'll put something on our WUVA, is that WUVA um, system? I'll put a real, a real vote there, and we want to know who was better, Elif or chat GTP on AI ethics, OK? Um, I know who I'm voting for. OK. Um, <laughs> And I, I think I have to go to you, is that correct? Yeah, yeah. so now, thank, thank you, you Francis, thank you. who is, let me repeat, our fearless leader, not our <laughs> So sorry I am live. And I'm going now to pass on to Anne, who's going to hand the, uh, do you prefer these ones? No, no, the fine. question and answer session, and I'll monitor the chat. So from now okay. on. So basically, I'm going to do nothing because I hope that you are going to have many questions. But there is a need for a little bit of organization. You have seen many speakers. So it's, uh, my role is just to try to uh, direct the question to the right speaker. Um, the way we have uh, thought of organizing this, you have seen all the different uh, speakers uh, talking about the general um, aim of the group. Uh, the definitions, AI, data visitation, and so on, and then these five deliverables. I'll, I'll so just... I will ask, do you have anyone in the room? And then I'll you just, go uh, to the yeah, chat. I'll, I'll show the list so people may have a better idea yeah, of the... Of, uh, of the... You come back to the, to the list no, of just, the... Just let's see here and Okay, here you find the, the slide with the five okay, deliverables. So these are the... And we also had the lift to give an overview of yes. AI and ethics, and we had Agushi to talk about fellows. Yes. And we had Lars that talked about some implementation issues concerning the distributed structure and security. So if I can do my role, then I... No, 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 I just <laughs> explain it. And now you, and now you can ask I questions. I ask the audience here, and you look on the chat, because yes. I cannot do it. Uh, oh, she's keeping and me I ask the talking. audience here, do you have question for the general presentation of the group that was done by Claudia in the beginning? You know, the, the aim, what uh, was it about, and the story of the group. Anyone? Claudia, you were perfect. Oh. So then we have... My a, mother a, also which, thinks the same. Which is maybe a bit different from other groups. You have had by Yugoshi the presentation of how we work with young fellows that are specifically attached to that group and to the different uh, uh, branches of work of that group. Do you have anything to ask about how this uh, system uh, works and uh, or question about the fellows uh, themselves? They are all online and can answer. Okay, <laughs> so I can tell for the fellows who do not see it that somebody here is saying that it is brilliant to have uh, you uh, working like that on defined lines and presenting in this session. And then Francis has something to say. I come to you with a microphone, <laughs> otherwise they can't hear you. <laughs> No, I just want to say um, we, we decided early on to have the fellows, and I think that's not something part of RDA normally, but we thought it's really important. We wanted to have some kind of teaching, mentoring structure in it to bring people in and also to involve people. And don't say this to the fellows, um, but we also, 
we also wanted to get the work done. It was a lot of work uh, that we have. We have a, you can see it's a lot of work there. And uh, this was a way to bring it in. But it's a really good thing because it's brought in, I think Anne, Anne would say too, Anne works with fellows all the time, but it brings in a real dynamic. And uh, it, it's, it's, I just think it's good. Maybe um, Elie wants to say something too. Yeah. Yeah, and while I go back to the front, uh, I can add on the fellows uh, aspect that uh, I'm involved in the deliverable three, which is the one on consent. And we have two fellows, you heard Noemi and Luis uh, presenting. And Noemi is from France, Luis is from Philippines. They never met before and they are working together. Uh, and they really uh, come out with uh, how is the methodology and so on. And I think this is very rich for the group, of course. Uh, we get a lot of work done. And uh, for them, too, to have this uh, early international uh, collaboration through this uh, group. Uh, there is a question on the chat about informed consent. Okay. So the question is how to think about consent in the virtual world since we have no control. Okay, so as we are going to take the things one after each other, I repeat the question so that I'll the people in inform, uh, involved in informed consent uh, can think about. Uh, we have no control on what is going on in terms of consent, so how can we use this tool? I, basically, that was the meaning mm -hmm. of, the, of the question. So please, uh, young fellows and Gauthier and all those involved in the informed consent, uh, have a little thought about it while I'm asking the audience. You heard a presentation by Elif about uh, AI ethics and why this was needed. Do you have any question about it? Yes, I can see a question there. Just a second, microphone is coming. Thank you. Um, is it on? Oh, okay. Hi, I'm Eileen Manchester. I work at the Library of Congress. Um, this is my first time attending RDA, so I'm very excited to be here and um, very new to everything. Um, my question is um, perhaps out of scope for, for the work that you're doing. First of all, I commend it and I'm really impressed by all the different things that are going on. Um, but given that AI, a lot of AI driven technologies function essentially as tools of exploitation, um, is any of the work you're doing around AI ethics, I think I saw this in the Bill of Rights and perhaps also in the surveys with real people, oriented towards critical or participatory or sort of like justice oriented aims alongside some of the more formal kind of research infrastructure questions? Okay, Elif, do you want to <laughs> answer that? <laughs> thank you, so um, thank you for the question. It is really important, but um, I mean, in terms of AI ethics, we are discussing that. Um, justice, uh, fairness, uh, ex access issues, um, they are, of course, part of the ethics of AI, because AI is a very powerful technology that the one who um, has the, um, the know-how to it has some power coming together with it. And, and this is very much uh, expressed in terms of technological substantivism. But in terms of this uh, working group, AIDV working group, we are focusing on issues that are common to AI, uh, data visitation, and open science, of course. So um, justice and equity and fairness is not one of the issues that we are discussing. Uh, but in terms of um, a, um, Bill of Rights, you know, um, the uh, concept of justice is a very huge part of the big picture. So there, uh, I believe there will be some, um, some um, thoughts about um, justice, but it's not uh, particularly uh, one of the uh, concepts that we are discussing in terms of AIDV working group. Yeah. We, we have a second question here. And while the microphone is coming, uh, you prepare to present yourself? 
Thank you. Hello. My name is Amy Nurnberger. I'm at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology Libraries. Um, building on what the, the previous questioner asked from the Libraries of Congress, I'm curious as to if this group has considered or how you might consider taking the care principles into account along with the fair principles, which include collective benefit, authority to control, responsibility, as well as ethics, those, those being part of that larger piece of ethics. And, and might you build something forward based on those principles? Do you want to answer that or to comment on it? Yeah. Um, I find it really very important. Yeah, I mean, fair principles and care principles. Um, yeah, they're, they're core principles, but in terms of discussing the ethical issues uh, related to AI and DV, I think we should first look beyond the principles because, you know, principles are generic um, statements that we have to specify and balance when we face an ethical issue. So, um, we, in terms of biomedical um, ethics, because it's, it's my field, because, so that it's easier for me to talk about it, there are the four principles and uh, applying those four principles to a particular case uh, maybe the application may be different uh, depending on the people who are using those principles. So I think we need specification and balancing. Of course, the principles are important. Yes, we should um, talk about them. But we should also talk about how we are going to specify them and also balance them when we are uh, addressing the uh, ethical issues that we face in terms of um, the, the particular um, problem. We have another question here. Monica Marin, a sociologist researcher in Romania. You said in your presentation something about social moral change. Could you expand on that? And one question about informed consent, I think. Uh, if you considered um, researchers that have been done on informed consent for vulnerable um, groups of people like persons with severe disabilities, uh, because there is a lot of research uh, done on informed consent for underrepresented groups. And if you consider this uh, in your project. Thank you. Elif. Um, social moral change. I mean, in terms of uh, what AI has brought into social moral change, uh, we can um, talk about it in two different um, subtitles. The first one is the pragmatic change. Um, with AI, we um, rethink some of the concepts that we think we are really familiar with. Um, because of use of technology, you know, some of the um, content of these content, uh, concepts changed. And uh, we can identify these changes by, um, by when we face an ethical issue, when we are using that technology. So there are some um, problems that we only face because we use that technology. And then there is the in, in, uh, interpretive hermeneutic uh, social moral change. And that is how we um, see an ethical problem when we get used to using that AI technology. So this is a whole um, different and big um, chapter uh, that maybe we should talk on social moral change. Um, the, the first step is being aware of the, of the social moral change that's, being, that's taking place when we are getting used to AI. For example, Francis put me on the spot by putting that <laughs> poster there and he's trying to race me with chat GPT. And as we get used to um, using that kind of technology, the first hesitation that we have when we face it is going to vanish. And then we'll, we are not going to maybe discuss some of the main uh, essential ethical issues. We'll just take them for granted. So that's a social moral change that we can only recognize when we look back to what we were thinking or discussing after we get used to uh, using that technology, yeah. And I'm realizing one thing, uh, while you are thinking about a question to, to Lars, uh, Lars, you remember Lars who presented about data visitation and trust aspects? So uh, I will uh, just, uh, I forgot to do that, present myself. <laughs> 
I'm asking everyone here, please present yourself. And then I didn't do that myself. So I am Anne Cambon Thompson. I'm from France, from Toulouse in France. I'm a medical doctor by training and a researcher all my career in uh, different fields related mainly to genetics and the, uh, for many years now, the uh, implications, uh, societal implication of the use of technologies uh, in health and specifically related to genomics. And I am one of the RDE ambassador in uh, this uh, domain. So now I feel with good conscience I've done what I should. And I ask yourself uh, in the, or also in the, if there are um, uh, questions in the chat, no? <laughs> About... The group is answering questions like crazy. You know. <laughs> yes, please. Hi, um, Paul Richards from UK Research and Innovation. Um, this is very interesting, it's new to me. Um, so uh, I work for a research funder, in particular a team that looks at sort of the policies that apply to our funding and our funding requirements. So I just, this is probably a general question for anyone on this group. What, are there any implications funders need to take into account in the work we do giving out funding and the policies we might apply to that in relation to sort of AI? Obviously, we have research data policies now that touch on ethics and stuff like that, but I'd be interested if there any specific considerations around AI we might need to be thinking about. For the microphone. Sorry, Sorry. I think that's going to be uh, a question for, um, for, yeah, for everyone, <laughs> but also for the, um, for the um, guidance on legal considerations for AI and DV. So um, my field is ethics. So I, I'm I'm working on gen general questions of um, how to. Um, compliance. There is the legal issues that we have to uh, look at. So maybe. Um, I think Alexander, and then I will say something or see about that. Yeah, you know, I don't know if this speaks to. And the whole, you know, research data sharing and preparing data to be used for AI purposes. They're the only actor who holds a big stick that can go chase. Um, at, in a scalable way across the whole ecosystem. So um, I think that, you know, if you look at uh, legal compliance generally and also Um, so I guess that means, or still not working? Oh, now it's working. All right. Well, so yeah, to make a very long story short then, um, I think there's a large role for research funding agencies to play in setting international standards for, um, you know, how research data can be shared, which they're already doing, uh, but also for things like AI transparency, AI bias. They are the only actor that has the ability to act across multiple jurisdiction and to, ho to hold researchers accountable um, on a you know continuous basis in those spaces, so so I think that's a role that they would have to play. Yeah, and I, I wanted to to uh, answer partly your your question too. Uh, as funders yourself, but all the uh, other organization funding research, uh, you also have a big role in choosing 
the topics of research. Uh, because you, you have uh, panels uh, selecting, you fix criteria for selecting. So including uh, a number of uh, criteria uh, related to ethics, to legal requirements, to uh, gray zones, and all these as research questions. Uh, may be extremely important because it's not only applying existing frameworks in ethics and legal, it's being developed at the same time as the technology. And I think that uh, really pushing the research on those aspects is part of what the funders can, can do. And this is very important to rely on, uh, well, well done research also for this uh, kind of regulation and not only on uh, chat GPT. Yes. Uh, okay. <laughs> no, I don't think that's the way they, they operate. <laughs> yes. Another question, Heidi. Thank you, Van. Uh, I'm uh, Heidi Leiner from Finland, uh, from uh, CSC. So I would kind of like to continue that thought and um, uh, ask a similar question about the because I haven't heard a lot about the, the bodies that hold the data, the ones that are being or would be being uh, visited. Uh, data repositories, I guess, would be a suitable name for those, those bodies. So what type of uh, recommendations would you give those actors? And, and have, have, has that... I don't know if, if, if this is working. The now audio? it's working. Yes. That, okay. Working okay. okay, so it's go up um, and down. While this is being uh, checked, there's a complementation to from one of our group yes. on, on the funders question, which is the following. The Open Research Funders Group convened some conversation about AI and open research, consent, subject rights, etc. WWWORFG.org. And so do CNI roundtables, WWWCNI.org. And this is a remark from Natalie, who is uh, involved in the AI Bill of Rights. It's, uh, it's not working. Um, oh, okay, so just a second. You can talk here. Work? No? <laughs> okay, then I talk here, yes. Um, we, we have had a lot of discussion in the group and in the different subgroups about the definition of data visitation and the relation that we were doing in that group between AI and data visitation. As you explained, that data visitation exists without AI and AI exists without data visitation. So all these clarifications will be part of the output of uh, what we give. Of course, it involves uh, the group, but at least it will clarify what we talk about for all the rest. And given about recommendations, we are not yet there. You have seen where we are, and I take the opportunity to underline that there are posters which are not the one of, uh, uh, <laughs> of the machine, uh, but there is a poster that has been done by Noemi and Luis, and another poster about the um, guidance for uh, ethics uh, committees. And uh, they are there on the wall, and they give a bit more information than what was possible to give in the five minutes um, of uh, presentation. So please take the opportunity after the session or whenever uh, to look at them, uh, because the young fellows have worked a lot to produce these posters. And the old fellows too. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I just have to come here. To see, no, there is no, um, so um, you can continue. No, you can, maybe you hold this here. And if I have anything to say, I'll run. 
Yes. <laughs> the old fellow. Yeah. Okay. Oop. You want me to hold this? No, no, that's okay. fine. Uh, so now, if there are no more um, questions generally on what we are working on, we are going to take the questions about each of the future deliverables and taking into account the fact that they are on their way and they are not ready yet. Uh, so the one on the survey on current ethical legal uh, policies uh, that was um, uh, presented. Yes, do you have any clarification or comment on, on this part? Brian talked about that and he was the psychologist, you remember. No, I, I, I'm absolutely no psychologist. No, no, I, no, no, no okay. the, I, the presenter. Oh, I thought about this was your part. No. Oh, any, anyway, anyway, the, both of you, I think, presented rather skeptical views or, or reflected uh, skeptical views about uh, making data available. And I must say, uh, at least I'm coming from Germany and we are always implementing things at uh, two or three hundred percent, at least uh, legally. And I think that the GDPR in Germany is going almost to a point of hysterical and paranoid and uh, I, I, I wonder whether you try to oppose that view with a clear thing like a, a message let's say that uh, data protection is killing people by holding back data which is clearly happening in some places including Germany I think So I don't know, uh, Brian, if you want to answer, and then, of course, uh, uh, Alexander in the room. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, I take... I'm sorry, just before Brian answers, there's someone that compliments that GDPR is an excuse for doing nothing. Someone added this comment. Okay. So, Brian? Uh, right, so, yes, I'm a psychologist, but I'm also at the end of research ethics rather than regulation, but I take the point, and you saw that during the, um, the pandemic, the COVID pandemic, where the um, EDPB recommendations, for example, were, you know, keep the regulation going, make sure everything is, is uh, battened down. But if you look on the other, on the other hand, by what people, how people respond, then people are starting to be more willing to share their data, not on the basis of regulation, the fair principles, if you like, the the um, security of the infrastructure, but rather on the basis of uh, what it does to society. So the the issue about or the, the question about the care principles is well met. So I think what you're actually seeing, but this is just from a research ethics point of view, is a willingness to engage and share ever more sensitive, not just special category data, ever more sensitive data, if the benefit can be uh, can be seen. But that's just my view. Um, I'll, I'll hand over to Alexander. Alexander. Thank you. Yeah, I, I think it's a really important question. And essentially, what effect is the GDPR having on information flows on data sharing? I think, broadly speaking, we're seeing it limit the willingness to try sharing information. And the, you know, the first reason for that is that the, you know, the text of the GDPR isn't particularly clear in terms of the you know circumstances under which it's actually appropriate to share information it's very principle based um, it has a lot of uh, you know principles that that are that are broad ranging um, secondly you know it seems to presume that information not flowing is an appropriate default position that uh, you know the the best practice is simply not to share data and I I think that reflects it does its design it reflects the fact that that was created with commercial information processing in mind or with state initiated uh, information processing in mind um, but that doesn't reflect the realities of uh, health sector organizations which tend to be incredibly decentralized and you know build these large scale data sharing networks firstly and secondly tend to have you know fiduciary responsibilities towards patients and, and other stakeholders to use the information that's shared in the best interests of the persons affected um, so I think that you know there, there's one of two possible out, outcomes that, that can occur in the in the five to ten year span the first is that uh, we don't see any major 
you know, regime change in terms of the actual rules that are applicable, that laws like the GDPR remain in place, and that organizations find some kind of, you know, tacit agreement as to what the best sharing practices are for data under that regime and obtain guidance from their regulators to implement that. So they speak to the regulator and they say, look, this is what we're thinking of doing. We're not certain if it's perfect. We're not certain if it's compliant, but this is what, like, what we would like to do. The second approach, and I, I really do hope um, that this will be followed, is to shift jurisdiction back to health care organizations, back to research groups to determine, you know, according to established practices within those communities, what the best uh, trade-offs between, you know, information sharing, information reuse on the one hand, and privacy, other societal values are on the second, not totally to their own discretion and, you know, in communication with privacy regulators and such. Um, but I think it's problematic that we're framing health data sharing as principally a privacy issue. I think it's principally a health system functioning issue. It's something necessary to the operation of our health system. And the privacy issues are important and they need to be addressed, but they're, they're ultimately secondary. Yes, you, you have another question. Yes. It's not that I have another question, I just have to compliment that there are other countries like Brazil that has LGPD, which is the equivalent of GDPR, uh, as of 2020, they're South Africa and so on. And in Brazil, an interesting phenomenon is that our GDPR came to awaken some scientists to the effect that data might be shared under certain circumstances, so that they are changing some terms of uh, consent, informed consent, to allow anonymized uh, patient data to be shared, whereas before it was not allowed. Just because our LGPD pointed out that anonymized data is not personal data. Okay, and they were not aware of that, and now they are sharing data where before they did not. So this is a, an interesting side effect, but um, I'm sorry, I just wanted to answer. There's all kinds of things. Okay. But, but uh, it's just people discussing among them. Okay. So, yes? Well, um, let me see. I, I, I was sitting there dreading you asking me to comment. Well, um, first, I, I think that uh, one can have to sort of think and recognize that uh, the idea of of the GDPR, although it's not perfect, it is our first attempt at bringing ethics and uh, privacy issues into a more generalized law framework that, uh, as we're speaking of, uh, as Alex was speaking of, and 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 that is a good thing to have regulation in that way. Uh, is it perfect? No. Do we need to work on it? Absolutely. Uh, but there are also other things that we can consider that because um, we can use this to help build trust among each other, right? So we can use this to show uh, trust. And there is where uh, me, I'm, I'm very invested in data visitation, of course. And, and here I see an opportunity. So I see an opportunity that we can, instead of sending data around and sharing, we can use the idea of sending our uh, uh, our, our, uh, our calculations or our, our work to other places where people can feel a uh, sense of trust and a sense of of accountability because in the end we need we need traceability and accountability in order to have trust where we share data to uh, with each other and one way of doing that is to uh, instead of sharing the data, sharing the science. So that that's sort of, I guess, a little bit of, of my thoughts in this issue. It's not all of it, but <laughs> just a bit. <laughs> yeah, if I can uh, add to that, uh, uh, many patients or individuals uh, like their data to be used, but not to be sent away. 
and I think that reflects what you what you were uh, saying. So it's not the use, and specifically when the use has a certain aim that is shared and transparent, it is the fact of sending, and you don't know exactly what can happen. Uh, so uh, securing this use that is transparent and uh, share no risk during the travel of the <laughs> of the data uh, is probably one of the way to apply and a GDPR um, is interpreted by institution in order to protect themselves. And that's where it's blocking. Yes, yeah. so please. 15 minutes on. No, um, I, um, I now ask Louis, um, I mean, there's a guidance on legal. I think that was covered as well, the guidance on legal. Um, because Gautier is disagreeing with Alexander, so perhaps the best thing to do, I'm sorry, but it would be the microphone to Gautier and Louise to answer the issues on informed consent and for Gautier to say he disagrees with Alexander. Okay. So, uh, Gautier, I think that you, uh, you have the word uh, to, um, uh, about the GDPR and uh, your views on it. Gautier, you yes, indeed. Okay, good. Can, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Yes. So it, it's a kind of disagreement, of course, uh, uh, with Alexandra, uh, because maybe I misunderstood also his point, but the original idea of the GDPR is absolutely not to favor looking practices. It is about favoring the free flow of personal data. And basically, it opens rooms for scientific research that are even more uh, evident than it was before with the directive of 1995. And it, it is opening rooms for the research uh, uh, actors to create their own rules and their own ethics. And that's why I'm. So based on this disagreement, I will just support what you said previously. I think it's a good idea to, to, to work on such soft law instruments uh, representing the view of researchers regarding data sharing, regarding artificial intelligence development and data visitation, for example, uh, by using code of conduct. I think this is really a good uh, uh, objective. Um, so th this was my 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 main point, and uh, so maybe m maybe you want to answer on this or, or to comment this. Okay, Alexander, uh, a quick answer, and then we will or... go to Luis and uh, <laughs> uh, the answers to, uh, about the question about informed consent. Sure. So glad to make a really uh, quick comment on that, Goti. I, I agree with how you framed it. What I would say is, you know, an interesting thing you see in the GDPR and in the the Data Protection Directive that that preceded it, for that matter, is that you know the law in its black letter on paper, um, you know, attempts to strike a balance between information flows on the one hand and um, you know the protection of fundamental rights, things like that, on the other. And I think under the DPD and even you know the early days of the GDPR, that was mostly the way that the law was framed. I think one interesting side effect of the, the Schrems line of decisions, so here Schrems 2 is you know, one, one of the, the big ones, and for those who aren't super familiar with the, the legal jargon, it's essentially um, a legal case that struck down the agreement enabling flows of information between the EU and the US. Um, one of the side effects of that, that law is that you see regulators frame the GDPR almost prints and, and, and courts, I should add, frame GDPR compliance almost principally as a matter of fundamental rights in those cases. And so that's, uh, at least by, by my reckoning, that's caused a lot of regulators, a lot of regulated bodies to err in the direction of uh, privacy preservation above all else. Um, and, and I agree with you that there's a lot of room in the future for other legislation, soft law as well, to figure out exactly how we, we strike that balance. But, but generally speaking, I, I totally agree with your comment. Okay, and we will come back in the group about uh, this conversation between lawyers uh, <laughs> that may be very technical. Uh, so now I would like to uh, give the floor to Luis, who wanted to answer the question about informed consent that were posed previously. Uh, uh, yes, yeah. yes. Uh, thank you very much. So 
I would like to beg the indulgence of the group because I will answer the question as a philosopher. So, so I'll just read my my answer to the question. So, I think we could uh, we could take the question in two ways. So, if the digital landscape is AI driven, so the exercise of informed consent would be indeed challenging because algorithms have now become more adept in knowing the individual. So, given Given that case, so we must ensure ways to make algorithms explainable. So in this case, we are trying to formulate an ethical framework in order to regulate the technology. But all, but I would also like to raise this one. So if the digital landscape is now uh, virtual reality driven, it holds potential in enabling greater exercise of human autonomy. So if we try to consider the ideas of Jaron Lanyard, the the spear the spearheader of virtual reality technology. So in this case, the, the difference is that technology itself is creating a new form of ethics. So I would just like to give this to the group to think about. So yeah, thank you. Any other answer or comment about informed consent from uh, Noemi or Gautier? No, <laughs> apparently not. Yes. It's not an informed consent. Oh, I have to go and read. I'm sorry. Thank you. The ballet of the microphone. Um, Brian says, to be contentious, GDPR is an elegant piece of legislation where it has gone awry, in my opinion, is the focus on potential for punitive measures for non-compliance. Institutions become risk averse rather than focus on collective benefit. OK, so this is just to complement the previous issue, but we still have uh, Natalie. Uh, yes. And I don't know if there is any questions for, for. I don't know if uh, there are uh, other questions. Natalie wants to talk uh, about uh, AI bill or uh, other domain. Is there any question in the room? Yes, so uh, Natalie, I give you the word so that you can express your, your, your comments uh, directly. <laughs> Please. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Um, one of the questions was regarding um, justice and the AI Bill of Rights. I think the question in the audience was about who has the rights and how to protect them, who protects um, individuals and communities in situations of social justice relative to AI and AI driven decision making. And um, one of the things we can see in the variety of the AI Bill of Rights instruments that are arising jurisdictionally at international, regional, and national levels is that the way they layer and balance one another, especially when intersecting disciplinary contexts related to computing, related to uh, research subjects related to consent, related to IRB, um, the way that AI Bill of Rights or AI Acts become uh, jurisdictionally layered will be quite important. I invite everyone to visit our um, shared uh, library um, and to suggest uh, information for us to consider as we build out our matrix of rights that are addressed by these various jurisdictional um, bills and acts, particularly um, as they relate to justice, human rights, human freedoms. Um, one of the freedoms I'm quite interested in protecting myself is the freedom of the AI modeler, the person who develops models and their right to deploy them. Okay. Does anyone have questions for our group? Sorry. Thank you. We'll, I lose weight to running like that. But anyways, so uh, there are lots of interesting comments um, from, for instance, Lindsay um, and Ye Young and others, but they are talking in the chat. Okay. So the, the, the chat will be uh, kept for the report of the session, I guess. Yeah. Yes, so we will be able to include your comments in the uh, session notes and the uh, report of the session. That will probably be done by Francis, who is going to talk now. Yeah, sorry. 
And just one thing, I'll, I'll put something in Hoover because I need a few points. You know, I'm a little bit behind in my points on Hoover. So I'm going to put a, a, a chat thing in there on Hoover about this session. And, and Natalie, um, if you could put the links in there for people, because I think people were interested in those funding links that you had. And other, Natalie is a source of incredible information. Yeah, yeah. And, I'll, and then we, we've got to put the voting thing in. Uh, vote for chat GTP, please. And uh, we'll, we'll get that then. Yeah. OK. Um, I don't know if, um, if there are comments or if there are um, reactions from Valérie. Uh, I can't see her, neither here. Uh, so so I, I think that um, I just wanted to underline that this part of the work of the group towards uh, uh, working for recommendations or guidance for the ethics committee's people is extremely important because in the end, not in the end, in the beginning of many projects, you have these committees that give approval or opinion or, and they have to judge, in a way, uh, the applications and the research. And this field of AI and data visitation, well, they, many of them have no clue about. So it's quite important to have good definitions, to frame the scope, so that they are able to apply the principles and to make their work of analysis and ethical approval uh, with good grounds. So that's one of the mission of the group too, that um, will be in this uh, deliverable uh, four. So I think we are approaching for the end. I just wanted to add to all of you, you all know that, but it, I mean, I should always remind you, come and join us. We are wonderful. Go to the RDA page and click on join group and you'll immediately have work to do and uh, monthly meetings which are fun. Thank you, Anne. But I have to say, if you are afraid of having more work, you can also be a member of the group to learn, to be quiet and you are not obliged as RDA is on a volunteer basis. Being part of a group doesn't mean that you suddenly have a lot of work to do. You are welcome to, but you are also welcome to be part of the group to contribute to some discussions or to learn. And uh, now I think that uh, I have to make the conclusion, reminding that uh, from uh, Francis that uh, there are votes uh, to, to do about uh, posters there. Uh, and. Uh, I want to thank you for your attention. I can say for the, the audience that the room was full of lively people with open eyes and they were not sleeping. Uh, so we hope that uh, there was real interest and I thank you very much. And thank you for the audience in the, uh, in the distance and to the contributors. It's very difficult, we know, to be in a hybrid session. So thanks a lot for all your efforts. I just remembered because uh, Francis and Anne, Alexander and I, we met online during COVID. Okay, so we are meeting for real. Uh, and that's an Elif. Well, well, but Elif I, I met recently, but I've been working with them uh, ever since our COVID report. So we are, we are, but I knew Lars before. So we are very excited. I'm sorry, Lars, but this is a group that was born out of lots of work we did together. And Elif with Francis and it is great to see people again. And thanks to you. happy. And thanks to our sound